Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Kateri Callahan, president of the Alliance to Save Energy. Kateri has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Kateri, for joining us today. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you. So the Alliance to Save Energy is such an interesting topic given our energy situation in the world today, how important it is to have energy that is inexpensive and abundant and also clean, sometimes right. objectives that are at odds with one, one another. Talk about the Alliance to Save Energy. Well, we're really kind of an odd duck in the nonprofit or the NGO world. We were founded by sitting members of Congress, Senator Hubert Humphrey, who was a presidential candidate, and a Republican counterpart, Chuck Percy from Illinois. And we, we were given birth to, out of the ashes of the first uh, energy crisis that the United States experienced back in the 70s, the right. oil embargo and the resulting high cost of energy. And those two senators were very prescient and saw that our energy problems that we had and challenges in the United States could only be really tackled and addressed if an alliance was formed between businesses, government, the labor movement, the then emerging environmental movement. So they forged- What a concept. It, I, I, yeah, I, come together I, I, and get things done. Right. <laughs> but if, you know, back in the day, those groups weren't really working together. And even still today, you know, there are, are times when it's very difficult to bring all of those key stakeholders to the table together around a cause. And, and you can look at what's happening in the energy space in the United States and in other parts of the world and see that there's a, a lot of uh, disagreement and controversy on a path forward. Where there's the sweet spot, where people come together, is the need to cut energy waste out of the system to drive energy efficiency or if you will energy productivity and so for more than three decades we've been able to keep that alliance together we've been able to keep republicans and democrats sitting and talking to each other and designing paths forward the alliance has 16 sitting members of the u.s congress bicameral from the senate from the house from the republicans and the democrats and from all points of view to the extremes on the political spectrum that can find common ground on this one energy issue. And it is because energy efficiency has something for everyone. It helps on energy security for our nation. It also helps on the environment, but very importantly, it helps our economy because we save money when we cut waste out of the system. And we're creating jobs by cutting the waste out of the system. So it's a win-win-win. It's a um, and it's, it's really been an interesting topic to grab onto and to bring people together. Um, and, and we've made forward progress over the course of the last four years, 40 years, excuse me. The country, because of the work that's been done to drive new technologies into the system, to put building energy codes and appliance and equipment, energy standards in place, we have cut um, 100, excuse me, we have cut uh, waste by more than 100 percent. We've doubled the energy economy in this country and by doing that we're saving Americans about 450 billion dollars a year in avoided energy cost and we're avoiding putting up two billion tons of CO2 of greenhouse gas emissions every year. So really really significant stuff comes from cutting waste out of the system. And the nature of cutting waste out of the system has evolved considerably. Nowadays we are talking about uh, new technologies, different light bulbs that utilize right. less um, e electricity, trying to incent those people um, in, in Silicon Valley and other mm -hmm. uh, uh, areas where, where new technologies are being incubated and designed by uh, university research right. centers to try and get those into commercial use mm -hmm. in a way that also cuts waste. Talk about the Alliance's role in driving that type of innovation over the years. Right. Well, I think there's, there's a couple of things that happen there. The Alliance has worked very hard to put in place a policy framework at all levels of government that can drive and spur continuous improvement in technology and continuous advancements in driving energy efficiency into the system. So when you think about a policy framework that works it, and so that it's, it, it works really in a virtuous circle, there are several different elements or legs of the stool. The first is you have to invest. Um, we need research and development to keep new technologies coming into the pipeline. So that's something that the private sector does, but it's also something that the public sector needs to do. You mentioned universities, but we have national labs right. and the Department of Energy and the EPA that invest in developing these new technologies. So that's number one. And it becomes a national security issue to have secure and plentiful 
energy. energy. It is it is entire. It's it's an energy security issue. It's also an environmental issue um, because the energy we use in this country comes with an environmental footprint. It's not you know the only the only energy resource we have that is completely um, has no environmental footprint is the energy we don't use. It's energy efficiency. It's right. doing more with less. But but to get back to it, so you've got you've got investment as a key pillar. Um, to making sure that we can continue improvements. Once you have those technologies developed, you need to help them get a toehold in the market. And so that's where incentives come into play, whether that's utility rebates, whether it's federal tax incentives, which we've had great success with. Um, in Intellectual terms of dry property structures. protections. Inter yes. And so those things help to get that new technology um, built into the marketplace enough and developed enough and prices coming down enough that it can be adopted in a widespread fashion. But to have that happen, you have to have education. So an, a great example of that in the United States is our Energy Star label program. Yes. So the new products that are on the market that are more energy efficient have an Energy Star label. And that way you and I don't have to look and, and figure out how much energy widget A uses versus widget B. We can see the Energy Star and know we're buying a product that's going to save us money and save energy. So once you have that, and the, the technology is in the market in a widespread enough way, that's when you kick in with the codes and appliance standards and equipment standards and you say to manufacturers on a technology neutral basis, you cannot produce these old products anymore that waste energy unnecessarily. You have to meet a certain standard. And the government's very smart about that and we've advocated it has to be cost effective. Mm -hmm. We don't want consumers to have to pay more for a product. Um, and so a great example is what's happened with refrigerator. Your right. refrigerator today, it lasts longer, it performs better, it's bigger, it's and, better yet, insulated. and yet it uses 10 times less energy than it did in the 70s. So yeah, it's just, you know, that's the kind of progress that we can make. Um, so those codes and standards are very important. The last leg of the stool, really is leadership by example. Um, the U.S. government's the largest single energy user in the United States, and it has very deep pockets. So what it buys and how it uses its energy has a great influence on our economy. And so we've been very fortunate that under Republican leaders, under Democratic leaders, our presidents, their administrations have made significant advancements and continue to in terms of managing their energy use to cut waste out of the system and procuring and buying new energy efficient products that help those products get adopted by the marketplace. One of the interesting aspects of what you do is that if you take the, the, the full supply chain from um, um, extraction or production mm -hmm. of energy um, all the way through to the uh, incorporation of energy into products and mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take a look at all of that, you actually cut the that whole piece into the end user piece of this. Uh, you're not trying to take on the entire issue. Actually, we are a little bit. Um, well, no, more than a little bit. We look at driving energy efficiency across the entire economy. So we actually do look at um, production extraction, delivery of, of energy. We spend a lot of time on what we call the end use. You say the, the mm -hmm. product use. We spend a lot of time there because there's such great potential. But there's widespread potential all across the economy. The, the beauty about energy efficiency, it's low hanging fruit and has been for 40 years. And it's like the gift that keeps giving. It's still there. I said that we've cut waste in half in our economy mm -hmm. over the last 40 years. We still waste more than half of the energy that we consume today. So the potential is huge. And it's a, it's, it's a fascinating thing because the potential is there to make a lot of money from harvesting that low hanging and even the higher hanging fruit. And so it's, 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 it, it's a fascinating conundrum because you would look at it and say, all right, well, McKinsey, economists look at this, they say there's so much potential and there's so much money to be made, but then people aren't doing it. And so why is that? And there are a lot of market barriers that are there and that we try to address and, and knock down to, to get that capital flowing and to get the investment uh, that's needed in order to capture this really huge potential. And the potential's in the transportation sector, it's in the built environment, and it's in the industrial or the manufacturing sector. So really, everywhere you look in the economy, there is a place to save. 
Well, let's talk about the transportation sector mm -hmm. uh, for a second. This is uh, this is very interesting because, of course, as as a consumer, I'm very familiar with certain aspects of what you're doing and mm -hmm. probably less familiar with others. Do you get involved in in advocating for policy decisions that would tilt the, the, the transportation uh, sector toward investment in, in, um, in rail over um, automobiles? You know, uh, we do engage in trying to drive higher investment in uh, public transportation. We, we definitely do that and in land use planning um, and transportation planning. But I don't know that I would say we do that at the expense of advocating for things that will drive new and better technology in personal vehicles. Um, you know, our, our kind of philosophy is we're fuel neutral and we're really technology neutral. We just want you to use less of whatever energy you're using and so the products really, to use it's less. it's really better use regardless as to how you choose to use it. It's exactly. Not, it's right. really not a judgment as to how you, you choose to use it. It's just if you're going to use it, you're going to, Yeah. we would like you to use the best the, of the alternatives. Right, we would available. like you, or we would like you to waste as little energy as possible in whatever uh, product you're creating, service you're using, product you're using, you know, why, why would you want to use more energy than necessary? You're only going to pay more, you're only going to pollute more, um, you're only going to make our country need to produce more energy, which makes us less energy secure if we can't produce it ourselves. So we, on the private trans or personal transportation side, we've been advocates for the tax incentives that are in place, for example, uh, for consumers who purchase battery hybrid and fuel cell vehicles, mm -hmm. moving us to a more efficient personal mode of transportation. Um, we have been longtime advocates of fuel economy standards, CAFE, corporate average fuel economy standards, and the new standards that were put in place under President Obama are actually going to save when they come into full effect in 2025. They're going to save you, me, and everybody else around the United States over a trillion dollars a year at the pump. And we're already seeing those savings because the manufacturers are moving toward those more fuel efficient lines of vehicles. Um, and make, trying to you know, meet the stan standards incrementally over the course of time. Um, so everybody wins in those kinds of, of instances and situations. And by providing those types of incentives, you're also creating whole new industries. You're creating jobs here in the United right. States. You're creating uh, technological innovation as well. Yeah, we actually did a study because we have a goal at the Alliance to Save Energy of doubling U.S. energy productivity between now and 2030. And we have a whole set of policy recommendations, 54 in fact. What a concept, more for less. More for less, right. more for less. And you know, we, we, so we had an economic analysis done, not, not mm -hmm. our own analysis because we know we're advocates. So we had an outside group come in and look at what happens if the United States is able to double energy productivity. First of all, okay. can we do it? The answer to that is yes, we've done it in a 40 year period. So we're just saying we're gonna condense the time that it's gonna take to do it. And then we said, well, what would that mean in terms of savings to the economy? $325 billion a year. We would avoid spending on energy that we don't need, that's wasted, and we could pump back into the economy. Uh, the economists found that the, the, uh, in the analysis that we'd create 1.3 million jobs in the U.S. by doubling our energy productivity. And oh, by the way, we would take CO2 emissions all the way down to a third below where they were in 2005. So what is the Alliance's position on uh, issues such as the development of alternative energy, solar, mm -hmm. wind, and other forms of alternative energy? So we are an alliance, a broad umbrella, and we have about 140 different organizations and corporations that work with us and support us. And they have interest in the renewable energy side and in the conventional ener energy side and, and all across the economy. Uh, so for us, we found it best to remain fuel neutral, to not get engaged in any issues on which fuels are better or even really mm -hmm. which products are better, um, so long as they're, they both deliver energy efficiency at the same level. Um, so we really do not involve ourselves in that. We also don't engage in environmental issues um, on, you know, how much emissions reduction should we require? You know, should we have license more uh, hydraulic fracking in the United States? We don't engage in any of that. And that's really kind of been the secret to our success because we look at it and say, whatever you're using 
it's important to use it wisely and to cut all the waste out of the use of it. And, you, and that's worked for us. Do you get involved to the extent of encouraging the efficient use of each of the energy um, uh, sources that, that we tap into? Right, and, and the way we do that, a good example is something that just happened um, this week actually on Monday. The energy, uh, the, excuse me, the EPA released a new plan for controlling emissions from existing power plants, right. controlling CO2 emissions, so greenhouse gas emissions from existing power plants. And the way that we've engaged in that rulemaking process, and we'll continue because this, is, this was just proposed rules and final rules won't be out until 2015. States don't have to implement until 2016. So it's a long process. Right. And our role in that has been to say energy efficiency needs to be seen as the first compliance option, the first way that states, that utilities should begin to bring down emissions because it's the cheapest, it's the quickest, it's the fastest way, it's the cleanest way um, to meet those requirements, those new federal requirements. And so we work to have a rule that will allow states to invest in energy efficiency, to have their utilities invest in energy efficiency, uh, to reward uh, residential consumers, industrial uh, consumers who use less energy because when you use less energy, you're reducing the emissions and you're coming into compliance. So that will be our role in it. We, we, we don't say the emissions reduction should be 5%, 10%, 15%, or the 30% that EPA is required. We simply say if you've got to reduce by that much, you need to look at energy efficiency first because you can get the most out of it, you can get it the cheapest, and there is zero emissions of anything associated with driving energy efficiency. Well, Terry Callahan, I think that, that what you're doing to actually bring these disparate parties to the table is just amazing in today's world. It's, it, it's a somewhat uh, sad commentary that it is so amazing, mm -hmm. but, uh, but perhaps this can be a model that, uh, that we can all look at. It, it seems that what you're doing is driving an agenda based on the common interests that we all have, mm -hmm. whether we are uh, mining coal in Kentucky or developing a uh, new um, solar array mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley or uh, thinking about wind power uh, in Kansas, there is a common interest in ensuring that this country remains energy strong. Right. And you have been able to triangulate amongst those interests and create real impacts. So well, thank you. I, I think it's you know it's it's the hard work of so many people involved at the alliance. But I will take the thanks on their behalf. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, and thank you for your insights. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.